Welcome. I'm so glad you could join us today for worship. Today we're beginning our journey through the book of Job, which has a lot to teach us about how we move out of a place of deep suffering and sorrow, how we move on with our life after the worst things we could imagine happen to us happen to us. It's a book that talks and shares with us and explores the ideas of where is God in the midst of suffering? What can we do to get God to speak to us in our suffering? What role do the people around us play? So I'm glad you could join us for worship this morning. We know it's been a long week. For many of us, it's been another hard week at home, at school, at work, and even in our communities. We come this day looking for refuge. All week long, we have longed for God's presence. When we went out, we weren't always sure you were there. When we searched for you, you couldn't always be found. We groped for you, longing for you, and sometimes we couldn't see you. But now, here, here in this time of worship, in this space of togetherness, oh God, we seek your presence. Amen. scripture reading this morning comes from Job 1 1 and chapter 2 1 through 13. <clears throat> there was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before God, and the accuser also came among them to present himself before God. God said to the accuser, where have you come from? The accuser answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to the accuser, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then the accuser answered, God, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to the accuser, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So the accuser went out from the presence of God and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd from which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home, Eliphaz the Terminite, Bildad the Shittite, and Zophar the Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw Job from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their head. They sat with him on the ground. 
seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to them. For they saw that his suffering was very great. They sat with him on the ground, seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his suffering was very great. How do you survive suffering? How do you survive when your life has fallen apart completely? How do you go on? And how do we as your friends and family respond to that moment, that time, that place where you are full of sorrow and grief and suffering? That's what I want to talk about. Because the story of Job is a story that's to get us to think about where is God in our suffering? How do we speak about the mystery that is God? And what is our role as friends and confidants, as the people around someone who is suffering? In this story of Job, Job doesn't just suffer one tragedy. He has five things that impact his life. First, a band of raiders come in and steal his cattle and kill all the servants watching them except for one to tell the story. Then a fire comes and destroys more. And then another band comes of raiders comes and takes what's left of the cattle. And then a big wind comes and destroys the house where all of Job's sons and daughters are staying, killing them all. And then Job is afflicted with an illness where sores, oils are all over his skin. And then it's like his life is falling apart. He doesn't blame God. He says, well, if you take the good, you get the bad sometimes. And his wife yells at him, you need to curse God and die. Just get out of here already. Enough. This is too much. And some of his friends decide to come see him. And that's what I really want to talk about today, those friends. Because those friends give us an example of how to show our place, our role in the life of people who are suffering. And the first thing that we learn is that they see Job. From a distance, they can't believe it is him because they've never seen him looking like this. Because he was one of the lucky ones, one of the blessed ones, one of the ones God has chosen to give abundance and bounty to. And so every time they had seen him before, he would have been in the best clothes and have had the best care taken of him. And now they see this man who is covered with lesions, who is sick, and who is full of grief and sorrow. So they didn't even recognize him as he's sitting there in the ashes, in the garbage heap. And as they 
see him. They see him. I think that's an important thing for us to think about in terms of suffering. Maybe the first step is to see, right? To see, to know, to understand. And I want you to think about it this way using a current example. In the last few years, we have seen countless videos of black men being killed by police officers. If you had asked any black person in America to tell you if the police are safe, if it is okay, do they feel safe when the police are around? They would have shared with you stories of people hurt and harmed by the police. That for hundreds of years, the police have not been a source of safety. But it's only now, now that we have smartphones and cameras everywhere, that we are seeing what they have known all along. That we can see the suffering with our own eyes. We can see a man shot in the back seven times. We can see a man out jogging, being chased down by white men and shot and killed. We can see it. And we can know that it isn't something that we can push aside because it's in our heads, it's in our hearts. We now know that this happened. And once you know, what do you do in the next step? Those men who came to see Job, those friends of his, see that suffering, that pain, that sorrow, and they know that they want to be there present with him. And so they do what you do to express that you have empathy, that you care about him. They rend their garments. They tear their garments. They tear their clothes to show their sympathy to show that they are connected to him, to be present with him, and to empathize with him. They share sympathy. And when someone's suffering, when a people are suffering, what we need to do is empathize with them, to sympathize with them, to experience and have compassion for what they are going through, to rend our garments in support of the suffering. And then his friends sit down. They sit with him. In silence for seven days, his friends sit with him silence for seven days they sit together they don't try to explain it away they don't try to make justifications for why it happened they don't try at this point to share with them that they know that there was this conflict in heaven and that god is against him they don't share that in this moment they just sit at that point their job is to listen and hear, to experience the story and the presence that Job needs to give them. So they sit. They sit in silence. They sit to listen. And maybe we need to learn that. Maybe we're so quick sometimes to seek out an explanation for what's happening, to search out the reasons behind what's happening, to make Something makes sense so that we can justify what happens when someone suffers, that we seek out the reasons for it. And what this story says to us is when that suffering is happening right in front of you, you need to sit. You need to get silent. You need to be quiet. You need to center and stay in the presence of the person that is suffering. You need to be with them. Be there to provide your warmth and comfort. Be there to say, hey, you're not alone. I'm with you. 
I will always be with you. And so they sit in silence with him for seven days. Maybe when we look at the world that we're facing right now, with the unimaginable suffering that happens, with all the people who are out of work, with all the people who have died, maybe our job is to follow the example of these friends. Maybe our job is to see, to know, to understand, to figure out why the suffering is happening. To empathize with those who are suffering. To put ourselves in their place, to see ourselves in their shoes, to walk in their place. And then to listen to hear what they have to say to us, to hear their stories and their heartbreak, to hear and listen to what they need to share about the suffering. Not at that point to say what's going to happen, not at that point to give advice, not at that point to go into fix-it mode, but in that moment to be, to stay with them present in the suffering to be that place and time, to just sit, to not do anything, to not try to fix it, but to be. We have a lot to learn from his friends about what to do when we encounter suffering. We need to learn and understand we need to empathize with the person who experienced the suffering. And we need to sit and be still and hold them. May you learn this week how to be present for those you know that are experiencing suffering. For those you know that are going through a dramatic illness. For those you know who are torn up by the loss of jobs, maybe even this week, the loss of their home because of the loss of jobs. Maybe this week our job is to take on that role, to be that friend in need for those who are suffering. Amen. you to settle yourself into prayer. I invite you to close your eyes and breathe in deep. As we breathe in, may we breathe in peace. As we breathe out, may we breathe out love. Breathe in peace. Breathe out love. Breathe in peace. Breathe out love. Holy One, they sat on the ground with Job. Job's friends saw his pain, saw all he had lost, saw how he was suffering. They sat on the ground with him. The United States has been full of civil unrest for months. Help us to see the pain, see the loss, see the suffering. 
The Middle East is engulfed in turmoil with airstrikes in Gaza and with the continued recovery of Beirut. Help us see their pain, see their loss, see their suffering. During this never-ending global coronavirus pandemic, we lift prayers for those affected. We lift our prayers for those who have been taken ill by the virus, for those who have lost their jobs because of the global economic situation. And we pray for those families who have lost someone they love. We lift in prayer those children who are starting school, those colleges that are starting. We pray for the families feeling stressed. Help us to see their pain, see their loss, and see their suffering. We pray for this earth, California burning flash floods in Afghanistan, hurricanes in the Gulf. Help us see the pain, see the loss, See the suffering. There is so much personal suffering that we know of. We lift in prayer our family, our friends, our church, our community. Help us see the pain, see the loss, see the suffering. As we pray together the prayer that you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. invite you to share your gifts, that they may help us to continue a ministry that connects with people who are suffering. Let us pray. Holy One, when we're challenged in life, we wonder what's wrong. Why isn't the world perfectly aligned to meet our desires? We give our gifts with hope that we might ground ourselves in gratitude for the blessings that we so easily come to take for granted. We pray for eyes to see clearly the bright mountains and the dark valleys with grateful hearts for both. Amen. We are invited to come to and gather at the table of love, to be nourished by but a taste of what good God desires to do among us. God calls us from the institutional halls of power, from the shelters and from the streets. God calls us from classrooms and pulpits, from bars and prison cells. God calls us as we are, from wherever we are, to come and be with Jesus, who loves and lives on the margins. God whispers, come and live abundantly, turning from all the claims that blessing flow from money and power and control. Come and love relentlessly, following Jesus on the path of uncertainty, taking risks for one another, calling down unjust power from its throne, and lifting up the lowly, the impoverished, the burdened. Jesus calls us, come near to the suffering in the world. He calls us to those places where people are so bent over in their sickness and illness that they just need a sign of faith. Jesus calls us to those people that we like the least, the ones we dis dislike the most. He calls those people to come, share a meal, learn about our faith. On the night 
that Jesus would be arrested. Jesus gathered his friends and companions in the midst of a tense and dangerous time. They found each other at table. Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God, and broke the bread and shared it with his disciples. saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, and shared it with his disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Let us pray. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit, breath of God, renewer of life, settle on these gifts that they may be transformed in our remembrance of your radiant love, your eternal embrace, and your grace that makes all things new. Amen. Take and eat the bread of life. Take and drink the cup of love poured out for us. Let us pray. God, this meal we share together is a remembrance of your embrace of the suffering, the outcast, and the oppressed. May it strengthen us as we open our minds and hearts to new ways of recognizing your presence among us. Amen. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will, that Jesus loves you and always will, that I love you and always will. May you be that friend to someone in suffering. May you see them, may you empathize with them, and may you listen to them. Amen.